Uh, thank you very much, Ellis, and, and thank you so much for the uh, wonderful Architecture Foundation, the wonderful and relentless Architecture Foundation 100-day studio. Uh, you've been doing an amazing job. Um, we, we're just worried that, that everybody will be drained of intellectual content by the end of the 100 days. Um, it, it's very much a, a kind of a home fixture tonight, and we're welcoming uh, Simon Jones, who I'm sure many of you know, know very well. I'm, I'm actually broadcasting here from a Simon Jones, a prototype Simon Jones studio. My, my wife's upstairs on the other computer watching it. Uh, it's, the, the, the laptop is uh, supported by Simon Jones trestles. I've got my Simon Jones Ikea stool here, which was actually assembled by Simon himself. So I feel very honored about that. Um, so for those of you who don't know Simon, uh, uh, Simon um, was actually, is actually an alumni of the CAS and studied with um, Philip Christo, um, Florian Bagel uh, and graduated I think in 2002 um, or perhaps slightly earlier but um, has been an architect since 2003 and he's run Simon Jones Studio since 2010 and really 2020 is when he, he decided to formalise uh, a very long-standing partnership with Jack Neville um, and the practice is, is now called jo um, Jones Neville. Um, Simon is an architect uh, and a, a furniture designer. Um, Jack Neville is a, is a furniture designer. He's, he's had an incredibly productive, um, well, the last decade, working very hard um, and, and collaborating with many, many other architects um, and, and doing many fit outs, um, designing products, as I've shown you, working on exhibitions, um, on commissions um, with other architects, uh, on, on art galleries, private houses. And I think one of the reasons why he very much sits within um, this, this kind of, um, this kind of oeuvre of, of, of these uh, 16 young architects from throughout Europe, which I've gathered for this lecture series, um, is he has, he has a kind of a very, uh, kind of sensitive idea of, um, of, of how you put materials to get together um, this, this whole idea of how um, kind of joining materials um, is very important to to you know not only furniture designer but to architecture uh, as well so Simon I'm, I'm going to hand over to you if there are any questions could you please um, post them as you go along in in the in the chat and I'll, I'll open it up to you uh, to your questions and and give you the mic at the end of the session so over to you Simon thanks James um, nice to see um, so many people and so many familiar faces um, I should firstly say happy birthday to Zoe it's her third birthday today or at least that's what Jack told me that's his excuse for not being party to this talk. <laughs> I trust that it really is her birthday. Um, I can see her. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm going to share my screen, James. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, as, as James said, I am my, my background, or I'm, I am an, I'm an architect. I worked in practice for ten years. I, I studied um, at what's now the CAS um, with Florian and Philip. Um, I, I later worked for Tony Fratton and Six A, and then uh, I began my own studio in two thousand ten, and, and I've worked with Jack for for, for most of those years. Um, this is our this is our uh, workshop and studio in a, a fantastic uh, co-op building in in Kentish Town, um, which we feel very fortunate to have ended up in. We, we have a small workshop and um, and, a, and a studio, um, but it's but it's really enabled us to do what we what we've done over the years. Um, as James mentioned, we, we we work on architectural projects exhibition projects um we sometimes make things for others we work with other architects and we'll design our own uh pieces of furniture either to commission or speculatively um this is one really this piece that we're making in this photograph i don't have many photographs of us 
and the studio. Um, but this one has really been a sort of mainstay for the studio. We designed a trestle uh, probably back in the days of working at 6A, you know, a, a sort of quite light it, as a typology and it grew out of seeing sawhorses on building sites and the idea of just a, a sort of modest table with a pair of trestle legs and a door blank. Uh, was something that as a student you'd sort of moved around and had this kind of very um, sort of ephemeral furniture. And, and this is a design that sort of developed, we, we've carried on making over the years. Um, so, sort of showing at the beginning because it's often sort of been the start of quite a lot of projects. People often come to us for a trestle and ended up with a building, an exhibition or a shop. But, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple design, um, much like the kind of sawhorse um, in, in a way, but it's a bit more refined, a smaller footprint. Um, and the bracing happens by an overlapping of the legs as opposed to the sort of ply end plate. Um, we still make them ourselves with, with pretty rudimentary jigs, the same jigs that we've used for sort of 10 years or so. With a, with a hand router and, and, and a sort of drill press, really. Um, we make them in batches as we make, make them, but it, but it means we can, we can make sort of decent runs of them and sell them at a price that makes them affordable for friends and uh, clients to buy and, and that we can still make money and make a living out of them. Um, like quite a lot of pieces that we make, we sort of quite enjoy the way that they can pack down and they can store and transport and ship quite efficiently. And, uh, sort of seems to have become a theme through the work that the, um, the proportions and the sizing of things is often based upon how they will store or stack or ship or, or being, the, in this instance, the legs are sort of half the width of the rail and they, they sort of designs so that they can be packed and, and stored. Um, similar with this project is a project for a, a stool, obviously, um, which was designed um, as, as a product with in, uh, the idea being that the parts could pack into a, a small box and they could be sort of carried or carried away under somebody's arm or in somebody's bag. Um, quite quite simple components. It's all made of beech. Um, the legs screw through a rail with a wooden wooden thread and they screw into the seat and the whole thing sort of held together with no fixings. Um, the project came about when I was working on a, I had a residency project in Norway and would see all of the um, outdoor, or the, the folk museums that show traditional houses and joinery. And they have these stools, which were milking stools. They're really humble little things, but they were made by, um, the legs would be dried timber and the seat and the rails would be green timber because there was no glue or fixings so they were made by you'd put the, um, the dried timber through the hole in the green timber and as the timber shrank as it dried out it, it held the leg it didn't didn't some, sometimes they have a, a wedge but but often they didn't and this was a sort of prototype that I tried making whilst on the residency and a version that, that, that Jack and I made uh, when I came back to our workshop and sort of had the tools and the routers and the equipment that we were accustomed to with a, with a wooden thread um, that allows the thing to, the, the whole piece to go together. So it goes together without screws or, or, or glue and can be dismantled into that little bundle of parts. And again, the, uh, the seat is four times the width of the leg, the rails is two times the width of the leg, and its sort of proportions are guided by that. Um, and, and deliberately made so that you get left with this little handle that allows you to pick the stool up from, from, from above. Um, this, this went on to probably become our first proper product. Um, we'd, um, We'd, we'd had conversations with um, Sebastian Rong, who at the time had a company 
called Wrong for Hay, which is like a sister company of a Danish company called Hay, which now, who now quite a big furniture company. We'd, we'd got some way with them in developing it as a, as a product that was going to be released. It, it changed somewhat for manufacturing purposes from our original design in that it, it lost its wood and thread to the tops of the leg and, and, and um, um, production and economy necessitated it had a, a metal thread. Um, just before that was about to be released, Hay agreed a, a partnership arrangement with IKEA where they would release a range of products. And this 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 one was moved over into that collection and handed over to IKEA. And we we'd signed away the, the rights or, or given the rights for this to be made by them, and and they changed it. Uh, the piece looked the same, but actually the the whole logic of why of how it went together and its proportions was was slightly lost in the way that it was put together. Um, I think we're sort of fine with this now, but at the time we was um, sort of put, put out by the way that the things have changed and, and the sort of conceptual logic of it changed, but it was a good lesson in, in how things change for production and, and understanding the reasons why these things changed. Um, but it became the beginnings of a um, sort of ongoing relationship with 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 Hay and Wong for Hay. Um, coincidentally, pr prior to that project, we'd been asked by um, a client um, who ran her, an office, uh, sort of a creative agency, if we could design some some tables to go with some chairs that they bought recently, and they, they just bought a lot of these chairs on the left, which were designed by Hay. And they had a, a kind of a leg profile, um, a sort of particular leg profile, which we um, uh, replicated or made a design in, in reference to this sort of T-shaped leg, and we designed a, the connection of the table base, it's not not dissimilar to a sort of standard table, but but all, but all all made of wood, quite a simple table. Um, but we, we really enjoy the underside of the tables and how how the joints are made and how things go together. Um, this was a patch that we made. We made, I think, 20 of them for the, the RIBA cafe, um, which again, we could, we could make in-house and make them as a batch much faster than, uh, than Hay can make them. Um, but we made a, a small family of those in circular, square, rectangular. Um, but during the discussions with Hay, Hay then asked if they could produce that as a table. And it became this, which is now again, our first sort of product under our own name and with, under, under license. And it's, it's produced in Denmark by a very good um, uh, so factory has made a lot of the uh, famous and historic Danish designs. Again, as a sort of a lesson for us in how um, the designs evolve, meeting with the factory and talking through production, our, our wooden connection detail became a sort of standard metal bracket and jump, uh, joints became strengthened with a sort of barrel nut that goes in from above. Um, these photo these photographs are from us. First, first review of the prototypes, which we saw when we visited Hay in Denmark. And as it turned out, they'd also just acquired the rights to produce um, an old Borger Morgensen chair, which kind of um, amazingly had exactly the same radius of the chair back as the end of our table, which I think has been very good for us because the, um, I think the two often get sold together, um, but great to be in such company. Yeah. But it was, it, was a, it was a leg that was made with a sort of triangular profile. Um, and something that, and a kind of illusion that we've come to really en enjoy, where from many angles you can only see one side of the leg and it, and it gains a sort of strange lightness. Could, you know, almost kind of paper thinness that 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 leg and it's something that we've um, um, 
so carefully articulated. And likewise, the, the radius on the, that triangle on the underside of the table, what it feels like to touch the table, um, and the effect that has on the, on the thickness of the table, and it's a sort of apparent, um, it's apparent way, it's, the things that we, um, th that we look at or that we enjoy looking at. Um, and moving on to a, um, another project again, this is a project which was an idea for a, a, a family of furniture um, based upon a horizontal surface and, a, um, and an angled leg. We, we, we've found over the years that when a table leg's angled, uh, it, it becomes much more, much more stable than a vertical leg. Um, so this is a, um, a table with a seven degree leg, but it, it grew out of a project which we'd done with the Kunstler House in Stuttgart. We, we were asked by the artistic director who'd seen a lot of the, the exhibition designs that we'd done over the years for, for Raven Row or uh, other galleries around London. She, she'd asked if we'd come and help her to make furniture for the first exhibition she was staging there, um, which we, 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 we did and we, we went and actually for that exhibition we, we decided that they didn't need furniture, we, we designed something different, we designed an auditorium with, with a big curtain for that show, but it started a discussion about the building and uh, how, how, it, how, it, how it didn't really function very well. Um, and they, so we managed to get some money. We, we made a feasibility study to look at changing the way that the building worked and reopening the cafe that was traditionally on the ground floor of this building. It was, it was an artist-run um, workshops and studios that was founded in the 70s by a group of artists, including Joseph Boyce. Um, and at, at its heart, there was always a, um, an artist-run bar and cafe on the ground floor. O over the years, this had been given over to a franchise and and run ended up being run independently of the council house and consequently it lost its front door um, and its social heart um, so we, we, we made a feasibility study um, and we we asked um, our friends um, Matheson Whiteley uh, uh, architects in London if they'd collaborate on this um, given their kind of experience on on similar building projects um, and we worked with them to uh, refurbish the, the building create a new cafe and ground floor kind of event space um, and as part of that we proposed designing the furniture for the for the project um, we one of the reasons for doing this was originally the building's furniture is designed by the artists themselves we in order to raise money for the project, we, we could we could get funding if we made the furniture as a project, uh, and we thought that we could make get more money more for our money if we built all the pieces in house. So we had an idea that we would design a, a bracket, a steel bracket, which you could use to join a stick to a surface in a way, and with that you could make stools, chairs, tables, shelves. Um, and it could be made in house. We just we just designed this bracket, um, and doing so meant that for, to make the furniture for the for the building, you needed a thousand brackets. And doing so meant that we could build make them in quantity and make them quite economically as a consequence. So this is um, a company in Southampton that we found that could um, CNC punch all of the components. They're an amazing machine, and then they're, they're all folded on again on a CNC press, um, and we made a seven degree angle bracket and a ninety degree angle bracket, or ninety seven and a ninety and a ninety degree bracket, and with that we could make this sort of family of furniture. We we spent some time developing different pieces. Um, stools quite easy actually. A, a chair is quite hard. Oh. We developed a series of prototypes and made this family, and then had orchestrated a, 
planned that we'd make it all in Stuttgart together with friends um, and the artists at the Kunstler House. So we, over a series of three long weekends, we'd arranged for the material to be sent to the Kunstler House. We produced the designs, made cutting lists. Jack, Jack and I went over. Um, we, we, we cleared one of the studio floors and set up a sort of ad hoc workshop, chopped up uh, panels of oak, triply panels, and oak, and oak and ash sections. This is, this is the, um, the artistic director and the um, sort of second in command chopping table and chair legs. Um, the guy who runs the screen printing workshop, drilling all of thousands of holes to make the legs. Um, some chairs in production. Um, they're everything sort of screwed together. We, we didn't glue or clamp everything because we felt that we could sort of put it together quickly um, and, and more simply that way. Um, we made upholstered pieces um, for sort of comfort reasons and acoustic reasons. Um, we deliberately designed quite a, a dinky chair as a, as a, for a cafe. Um, but this was a way of, of using the um, upholstered seat pad. It's a very, very simple thing, just a thin sheet of MDF, and a bit of foam overwrapped a staple, but we could, we could rivet it onto the framework in the same way that we rivet the plywood uh, seat and back um, and, and get this sort of, um, dimpled effect as you might get on a, a sort of Chesterfield or something similar. We, we like the fact that that um, gave a, uh, a, a nod to the softness of that seat. Um, there was a family of stools, a sort of simple low stool, medium bar stool and a tall bar stool. Um, tables of different sizes, some small, some very, very large. And this is what we, we made over the course of three weekends. Um, I think it's 100 and, 105 pieces of furniture in total. It's, so quite satisfying as a, as a production run. Um, and because it was all made in house, everybody, everybody there had quite an attachment to it. Um, and we sort of hope that it will get trapped differently as to it would as if it would be sort of bought in from Vitra. And, um, we supplied them with more brackets. We, uh, we like the idea that they can they, could, they can produce their own furniture, not, whether it's to these designs or um, sort of cruder, more more ad hoc versions. But just using this bracket affords them the chance to to make to make their own things. In fact, in fact, on the opening night, the the caretaker, the housekeeper of the Kunstler House, um, knocked up a, a bar out of old bits of three by two and brackets, which was really nice this is exactly why we designed that, that bracket um i guess what one of the ways that we we sort of earn our keep is, is is producing being able to produce the work ourselves we we don't sell much through shops but, but we were able to um sort of make pieces at a viable price by producing them ourselves um, but often to do that, there's um, we end up making them in a very particular way, and we, we'll often use only one section of material, or kind of make the machining quite simply, or try to make things very very economically. Um, this is a batch of tables that we it's in production for a design that we have for a folding table. Um, it grew out of a, a, a commission we were asked to make a folding table, but it's that we've now made in many iterations, um, but it uses a single um, section size of oak. Um, and as you chop down through the lengths, um, there's very little waste at the end of it. We've made it in, with lino surfaces. This is, this is made out of larch ply and solid larch. Um, it has a mechanism that uh, there's some sort of round, round turns that will lock uh, the leg in a in its open position and also in its closed position. Um, 
I guess it's kind of a nod to a sort of German beer keller furniture, but, but it's all made out of timber. We can make it in house. And there's a sort of garden gate hinge that holds it all together. But they're really robust things and they, they can pack in a sort of satisfyingly flat way. This, this, is, this is a set we've made for a traveling workshop that um, went around the Olympic Park. And actually got a kind of real beating, um, but, but, but sort of proved its robustness. Um, but it, it grew out of commission. We'd been, uh, we'd been given to make a, an outdoor table, a garden table, um, uh, for somebody's sort of small yard. Um, this, this is designed as a slatted table, so the rain will go through. It's, it's made from a, a treated timber called a coir, which, which doesn't rot. Um, and again, so this shows the pieces that those tables are made out of, sort of all, all from the same section. Um, and when we buy the timber and you chop down through the sizes, you, you end up with very little waste in the way that it's been made. And, the proportions again are sort of three to two. The, the, the thickness of the table when it's folded is sort of three layers of material thick. Um, so it's, it's 18 mil by 54 mil. It makes for quite a compact table. Um, again, this is something that we've, in the way, in the way that we work, um, seems to be a, a kind of reoccurring approach. Um, this is a stool which was made really out of the leftovers um, of an exhibition project that we were making. It's made from uh, poplar um, and it's, um, it's 11, 11, only 11 mil thin. Um, because of that thinness or thickness, you can make a stacking stool um, that, that will stack um, in a very compact way um, that you wouldn't be able to do with if the, as the material gets thicker. Um, it's an incredibly light stool, but but, but really sturdy. Um, we designed them for um, an exhibition stand that we've made for, for over the years for Allied editions. Um, we were asked by a curator who was coordinating all of the London public galleries if we could find a way that they could show um, all of their editions, um, but they need to show them much more densely than, than they would be able to do if they just hung them on the walls. We designed a, a kind of sort of shelving system where the, the frames could overlap and when they were sold, they could be taken away and, and then another piece put in its place without having to re-drill and re-hang the wall. Um, but these stools were, were made out of the offcuts of that. This is them, the sort of table that we designed to, to go along with them. Um, early shots from probably eight or nine years ago now. Jack, Jack making the first prototypes whilst I was away on a residency um, in his shed. Um, very sort of simple pieces, all, all again, all made from the same timber section. Um, and stacking very elegantly. Um, again, Another project fairly recently now, um, using a, a single section of timber, we, we were asked by a gallery that we work with regularly. They thought they'd asked us to design a table for a big exhibition they were hosting at Freeze, but actually they'd, they'd forgotten to ask us. And with, with two weeks to go, they said, ah, we need some really big tables to show um, lots of sculptures. Um, it was an exhibition that they'd hosted it up in Park Studios um, near Regent's Park. And we said that we would help, but we'd have to, we'd have to do something very simple and expedient. So we, again, we, we, we'd been working a lot with Siberian larch timber. So we, we ordered uh, lots of planks that were, were planed. Um, they would have a, a quality in their, in their own right, but also a relationship to the building in which they were going, these, these sort of fantastic trusses of the, of, of the room with a sort of similar grain, similar board size. We, we made very, very sort of elemental trestles in a way, um, 
using the, the planks, screwed them um, from underneath with, with very simple joints, but the, um, the qualities of the grain and the, um, and the knots was, went down really well. So they became a good background to the works that were shown and actually some, one of the artists has subsequently um, asked to, to reuse them and the, 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 these timbers have been, some of these timbers have been now flown off to New York to be shown again and, and reassembled and it's, it's, very, it's very pleasing that the, 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 the timber kind of has a, an onward life after these short exhibitions and it's become something that's become a real concern for us now about what happens to the things that we make after exhibitions. Uh, we put a lot of effort into things and weeks later they can end up in a skip or um, get thrown away and we're, we're, we're now very conscious of that. Um, these have a life either as more tables or or just a sort of timber stock at the end of it because they've, they've not been treated or laminated or glued everything just comes to pieces um, this is another exhibition um, from some years back but i guess with a similar some similar concerns um, we were asked if we could make uh, exhibition furniture or a way of showing a new collection of lighting by by ron for hay um, in the old St. Martin's building of, of, of Holborn. Um, a really grand space, which when we went to visit on the first day was, was quite imposing um, and quite difficult to know what to, build, what to place here. Um, our workshop's well suited to building in timber, oh. but, but, but an oak floor, it was difficult. We found it difficult to, to place um, softwood timber or another timber on that on that floor. If it just feel like it fitted, there's, there's, some, there's hardwood rails built into the stonework of the wall. that were originally there for people to be able to pin up to pin up work. Um, but our, our early designs have been based on using the larch plywood again, but it, but it never felt quite right. And actually, one day we'd, we'd used a cork rubber composite for a floor for a, a gallery project we'd been working on. But realised that actually it had a kind of quality a bit like granite. In the middle of that space, there's this fantastic granite column. Um, um, and we realised that maybe this was a material that was neither, neither wood nor stone. It had a sort of ambiguity to it. And we realised that we could use it in a way where we could make it look massive, even though it was just a thin sheet. We, we, we used it in four millimeter and one millimeter thicknesses as a sheet. But we found that we could we could overclad forms, and then by radiusing the junction between the one millimeter and the four millimeter, that 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 junction, that glue line, that junction would be lost. And, and it would make volumes that looked like they were made from solid lumps and um, quite a satisfying way. They had their own sort of material quality, um, the very background, you could sort of anything would sort of sit, sit well on them without clashing. Um, then we came to kind of quite enjoy how you detail these and the forms that we could make from them, find that we could have overclad anything with this material, turn an old drain pipe into a, a sort of column. Um, we, we, we made it, we installed it in London and then we were then asked if we could make it again to show at the Milan Furniture Fair. This is, we made all the pieces and shipped them out and then went over and, and installed them there. Um, this is a photograph of, of the stand in, in Milan. Um, we then asked if it went down very well, if we could, if we could develop it into a um, shop, a shop fit display that um, throughout, throughout the shops around Europe, we'd develop a, um, a family of parts that could be installed to be able to display their collection of lights. This is um, 
to an installation in, in, in Copenhagen that we made. Um, that, 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 is, that, that theme of making something, I mean, very often with out of very inexpensive materials, I mean, the previous project was made from really thin cork um, and MDF, quite thin. Um, again, this is another project where we used quite a quite a kind of humble material. We ma we made it appear quite massive and, and quite um, uh, kind of ambig ambiguous. Um, this is using grey valchromat, um, but detailing it in such a way when you radius those corners that it, that it looks very solid. Um, we used it as an exhibition for a uh, vitrine system for the design museum, um, which could conceal a, a, a sort of prop attached to a picture rail. Um, but it was a, a sort of system of uh, exhibition vitrines um, that has, had a nod to the concrete beams of the building, but but also um, so, a quality throughout the material when it gets scratched and knocked it's not like the veneer of the building it shows scratches and ages badly this this be solid and, and, and colored throughout um, this is an exhibition project also i guess um about surface and, and kind of material we, we were asked if we could Make an exhibition at Herwood House in Leeds, uh, and the curator had wanted to show some contemporary craft pieces throughout the rooms of the house. And it's a really difficult question of how you put, how you show anything in this room against all this old Chippendale, you know, this fantastic Chippendale furniture on these great carpets, and and and, and make it stand out or, or, or allow visitors to to be able to to notice it. Um, we decided early on that maybe one way of doing that was, was through colour and, and solid plans of colour. Um, by, by chance, the, the curator had, had managed to wangle some sponsorship from the paper manufacturer GF Smith at the time. Um, so we, we'd ended up being given sort of given this material with which to with which to work. Um, we, we'd explored how to use the paper as the as the of, um, the infrastructure, the, the, the background for this project. Um, lots of the, we needed to design lots of plinths and surfaces in which to show things mainly so they could stand out against the house. Um, we found a way again of, of wrapping MD, of MDF elements, a bit like a bit like the court project that I just showed, um, but using paper is quite different. It, it changes in humidity and it's very susceptible to damage um, but it has a thinness and a great um, matte quality in the way that it reflects light and um, yeah, has a, a really great quality as a, as, a, as a material in its own right and placing objects on it it, it, was, a, it was a great background for things. This is in a studio which we found a way that actually we could dry dry mount with sort of, sort of large rolls of sticky to form flat surfaces. Um, GF Smith would, would um, duplex the paper into thicker sheets. So we made all of our tabletops and um, project by 10 mil. But we duplexed it to 180 GSM. So it had a, th a sort of thickness of cardboard, but still a kind of fragility of paper. Um, we made this interpretation panels just using cardboard and they would stand as columns. We could print directly onto it as well, which was a really nice thing to be able to do as opposed to having to have separate um, captions. So we, could, we could print onto the surfaces of the plinths. We really enjoyed that sort of thinness and, and still communicating that this was made with paper. We always tried to reveal that, that thinness of that edge. Yeah, we could we we used the the colour palette of Jeff Smith's paper. Every, every exhibitor, I think there was maybe about thirty exhibitors in the exhibition. Every exhibitor had a different colour. 
uh, paper uh, chosen based upon the room or based upon the work. Um, the thinness of that paper we could we could cut through to 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 reveal objects beneath with sort of secured under glass but just held by the paper. Um, and in some quite grand rooms. Um, but things look good against the background of the paper. Um, and to the point that we asked GF Smith to die cut us a lot of triangles. That, that, that paper only comes in um, a size just over A1. So to make any large surface, you needed to use more than one sheet. And this is a way of, by making the, the module smaller, it felt like we could, we could make a, a kind of continuous surface uh, to be able to which to place um, the artist's works. Um, again, a, a way of um, look, looking at the, the edge and, and, and a surface. This is the beginnings of commission for a, um, a, a large table for for free for the, um, the art fair company Freeze. Um, we'd we'd been asked to make a effectively a boardroom table, but we wanted to make a, a very modest table um, but with a material quality. Um, we used uh, Douglas fir but um, with, with a cut with the grain as a, as a vertical grain as opposed to crown cut grains. So it has a very tight and very quiet um, quality to the, to the grain. Um, we machined up pieces and, um, and made our own sheets um, to form the outer layers of plywood and we, we glued to a solid Douglas fir plywood core either side and pressed our own plywood which we turned into a large round table um, but it had a quality to the edge that we really enjoyed as, as the grain went around the circle the direction of the um, the end grain and the side grain changed as you went round between the different five laminations. Um, we'd used that material before when we worked, we were asked by a Japanese tool manufacturer if we could make um, an exhibition stand for them. Um, we, we chose vertical grain Douglas fir because of its similarity to uh, traditional Hinoki Japanese cedar. We designed a series of trays which could be assembled in a variety of different ways as a modular, either upside down um, or at an angle or with an, with, a, with an inlay, but just as, as a material against which things would look, would look good. Um, we subsequently designed their, asked if they would design their showroom. Um, again, referencing traditional Japanese material, we, we made a uh, showroom and offices for them using Douglas fir, but also with Tungra of chipboard, which had a, a really nice material quality. It's, a, it's the cheapest material in the hardware store, but used correctly or well, used in this way, it just had a, um, a quality reminiscent to the Japanese um, straw and hemp walls. Um, But made a very flat um, background. Um, again, we used the trays. We, we we made a series of panels with felt. That things could be wired through and displayed on a um, <coughs> a panel system, not dissimilar to sliding sliding doors in Japan. We 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 we, we um, sort of manifestation a bit like cherry blossom at the back. Um, all of this was actually built within their warehouse. So, um, the, 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 the beams that form um, across the space and sort of help make the scale of the different rooms actually was tying together the, the two walls of the building and allowing light to, to kind of filter through above them in, in one corner of a giant warehouse where they kept all of their stock. Um, so another project using the same material, we were asked to design an exhibition for an artist called John Sheehy, who was a, produced a prolific amount of work. He, he 
spent a lot of time living on the streets and had um, mental health uh, problems, but was was painting as a way of working through those. And I had a um, a body of work which Studio Voltaire presented. Um, they asked if we could help them to, to design a way of presenting presenting this, but it, given that they thought that it didn't feel right to show it on sort of traditional white gallery walls, so we decided we would use this chipboard again. Um, it felt sort of suitably humble, um, but they wanted to make as much surface as possible to be able to display the work. Um, there were thousands of pieces of work, and they would they couldn't show, possibly show it all in at once. So they decided that they would rehang the show every week and invite different artists to curate the rehang. Um, but asked if we could give as much space as possible. So we we made vertical platforms, a uh, vertical surface over the walls, um, which would cover over the the arches and the um, the recesses and alcoves of the of the existing building. But and we made simple uh, platforms and surfaces um, around the floor, giving just enough space to walk around, sort of 1,200 route around the show. Um, it was a really cheap exhibition to install. Actually, when we watch in galleries, the amount of time that's spent filling gaps between panels, sanding and painting, and painting, overpainting and filling, this went together just with tongue and groove plywood, uh, tongue, tongue groove chipboard, the boards stay flat, went together incredibly quickly in a, I mean, a matter of days and very inexpensively. Um, and, and made a show um, which seemed right for the, for the work we, we felt. Um, and afterwards all the material could be, could be reused. Um, this is the Allied Editions exhibition design that we mentioned earlier on, we, we've designed a, a system for, of shelves really where works could be displayed balancing on the front edge of the shelf and leaning against the back of the next one. Um, where work could be displayed quite densely and, and, quite, uh, and quite loosely. Um, we've, we've used it many times now over the years for Allied Editions and um, the pop-up galleries that we've made for House of Voltaire over the years um, in, in, in different incarnations. Um, but we, we'll often work with an idea and develop it um, for, for, for different clients. This is, this is a sort of a version of that that we've made as a, as a product, as a, as a sort of shelf for being able to, sh to house books and artworks on a domestic scale that can be provided in a, in a, in a not down way and um, could be shipped in a box, but very simply screwed to a wall. Um, we were asked to make a, a window display for an, an art book company called Tender Books in, in London. And we developed this design again for them as a, as a sort of modular system that they could use for both the shop window but also for book fairs as a way of displaying books, but with a density and height in a shop window. Um, again, made from a series of just a, sing a single section of oak, but with a, a sort of neat grub screw fitting and a, and a seven degree rebate in the front edge of the shell of the rails. Um, but can be so dismantled or assembled in, in different different ways to, to suit the um, to suit the occasion. Um, it sort of moves on to another exhibition that we did right at the start of our um, work together. We were asked by a curator if we could design an exhibition um, to show the the back catalogue of Richard Hollis, um, sort of fantastic graphic designer. Um, whose work um, stood out for its sort of pragmatism and, and its sort of humble qualities. And in our first meetings with him, he described how he would often design fl flyers and posters for the shows that would be folded or could be sent through the post. Um, they could be posters and they could be leaflets. Um, 
the curator didn't quite know what what was going to be what they were going to show only that they would show books uh flat work posters um and that it all needed to be protected because it was all one of kind and it was coming from richard's collection largely um it showcased his work from um a period of working for the white chapel um and and and, and onwards a lot of um his work as a publisher so we, we designed a system that would be that would be sort of similarly light adopting this idea of a fold so we could make these sort of long tables from nine millimeter plywood with a piano hinge down down the middle which could span with very simple legs it was going to be a traveling exhibition so it could fold up and be shipped and we made a, a series of modular boxes based upon the b size paper system thinking that that would allow us to show a lot of the a size work that, that might be that might be needed and the image on the left shows um an, an a an a2 box an a3 box and an a4 box um at three different heights um it could take a book or could just have a, um at its least could have just a piece of perspex laid over it as a, a to show a flat piece of work and they'd all be held on a an, an inclined surface um, the curator could shuffle them around depending upon how she wanted to show the work and, and, the, and the venue. Um, and so we liked the, the simpleness of the materials. Again, we were working to a low budget. The gray, gray board was the sort of least expensive material that you could get. And, Sticking two, two, two pieces together, we could make a rebate that we could lay a, a sheet of perspex into to form a, to form a very inexpensive vitrine that would sort of protect the work. Um, and this is the last project I'm going to show, but with sort of some sort of similar concerns, the idea of using very um, minimal material for exhibitions that don't last very long. Um, and now being more, more and more aware of the waste that we're making when we make these exhibitions. Um, because we had to finish on this one in a way, this is it being the exhibition for the Architecture Foundation that we made last, a few months ago. Um, we were asked if we could make um, a, series of table, a series of surfaces to show the work of um, 20 or so um, architects projects for about um, religious buildings or secular buildings, all to do on the idea of congregation um we knew that we had to support um big architectural models um, um but it was a show that was going to travel as well so we designed this way of making um plinths for each exhibitor um, uh, from a, a sheet of two sheets of two millimeter mdf with a 12 millimeter sort of slotted core and a nine millimeter mdf lid uh, which would sit on top of the, the cruciform core and the, um, this two, mi two millimeter wrap would be held with a, a sort of simple cam strap uh, easy to put together very fast for installing but in, in, su surprisingly strong for the amount of material which is being used um, again we're sort of concerned with, with, with the edges of things and um, the thinness shows the, um, the edges of the tables and the way that they were designed at different heights so they could overlap and form a sort of chain around the room in keeping with the graphic design of the project. Um, graphics directly onto the surface. Um, but, but hopefully all with us, despite being lightweight with a, um, an equivalence to these great columns in the crypt space of uh, St. Mary's Church, um, St. Mary Magdalene's Church in, in, up near Paddington. Um, and that's our last slide. Thank you. Simon, thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute everybody for some applause now before we have questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can go there.
So I, I, um, I'm going to ask the first question, and then I do have some other questions as well. So I'll, 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 um, I'll let you know. Uh, but I've got a few here. So someone had asked my first question, so I've got to change my question. So um, <laughs> I'm going to ask. Um, you talked about the um, the kind of the expense of um, say or the preciousness of furniture. So say vitra furniture and and, and the kind of this idea that you want your furniture to be not expensive or it should be able to be, um, let me just unmute you. People should feel uh, relaxed to kind of use your furniture in an, an everyday way. Could you say something about that, about, about how furniture is, especially by some architect designers has become a very valuable commodity? Um, yeah, I, I mean, some, some of it I think begins out of necessity and start starting out you, you can't afford expensive materials to work with and um, sometimes commissions are a way of being able to explore developing a piece um, and it's pretty rare that we have clients with with lots of money um, to, to spend on these things but I think there's also there's an appropriateness for for, for, for how much something should cost or, or, or what something should be and sort of trestle's a good point it's sort of been a consistent thing that we've kept making and it's a real pleasure that the majority of our friends have these trestles in the houses and the fact that we can afford to sell them and it feels um it's a fair price for something um and um yeah i think it's it's no, no more than it needs to be i think in, in um and that's probably quite a good sort of guiding philosophy for what we for what we make i have a question here from takeshi so takeshi i'm going to unmute you now uh hello hey thank you hi i'm on stop video too hello hi uh well thank you for the great lecture i have a very simple question why you use seven degree what is is this something particular about set number seven we always used to use 10 actually in fact the trestles are 10 but when you make a stool particularly a low stool with i think i think i remember when we first started using seven it sort of came about using it for for leaning artworks it's a good angle to lean a picture um but i think also when we made a stool a 10 degree angle on the leg meant that it had quite a kind of big footprint or kind of clumsy footprint and maybe when we were making that bracket we, we first prototyped it at 10 degrees and it and it didn't work you, you, you the footprint of the stool was was bigger than the seat um the legs sort of protruded from this from the the plan the plan of the seat um seven degrees sort of worked and um i don't know we just it just sort of felt 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 right in the end great thank you uh, so Matthew, Matthew Salinger, are you, are you still there? Would you like to ask your question? I can. Um, hi, Simon. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? Very good. Nice. Very nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Um, I was wondering how all of the experience with making all of this furniture started to affect your architectural work. Um, and I was thinking that maybe you could give an example of some way that it affected the way that you designed the conversion of, uh, of a recent house you were working on. <laughs> um, I, I think I think one of, one of the reasons I started making things was uh, I sort of studied as an architect and quite enjoyed making um, as, as you do as, while studying and sort of carried that on in parallel with practice and sort of always making things whilst working at Tony's and Six A and. So I've even sort of set up a little workshop at Six A to be able to make my own things. Tom and Steph have been sort of really supportive of, over the years. Um, but I think I first realised I've designed something, asked somebody else to make it, and when I'd gone to see it, you could tell at the beginning that it was just it was it was crap. And I think if you'd cut the piece of wood yourself and made it yourself, you'd you'd have known from the start that the leg was too thick or that um, that you've got the proportions wrong. And, Maybe some designers just sort of have a 
an intuition about the materials, but but I, but I don't, or I didn't. And maybe it's getting better, but I think the act of making it yourself, you get an understanding and a feeling for a material. Um, uh, this last project we showed, you know, sort of knowing that the difference between two millimeter MDF and three millimeter MDF, we, we sort of now got a feeling for. It. They act quite, they react quite differently, and being able to sort of find things down. And, um, I don't know th this recent house that you refer to <laughs> is our own house. Actually, now have the skills to be able to to, to make our own windows and doors um, and make them how we want them. I couldn't have done that before. Um, and it was, I've learned a lot as we go along. And so that was sort of Jack's influence as well in the, in the sort of approach to making. Um, but yeah, I, I think it certainly informs the way we, we put things together. But yeah, I guess also now we've, we're working with other architects and so sometimes we'll make joinery and pieces for, for architects whose work we, we, we admire and, and have worked sort of quite collaboratively and, and really enjoyed that as well. Um, I, th I think oh, and that's, that's a good, that's a good um, point to bring in Hugh who wants to ask. <laughs> But here's Hugh Strange. Yeah, no, he's going to unmute us. Hi, Simon. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Um, so, Simon, I think the I think the work's really great, and um, um, as well as this kind of combination that you you have of intelligence and modesty in your work. Um, one of the things that I think is really distinctive is this. Um, uh, you touched on appropriateness. This kind of judgment that you have of appropriateness and getting things just right whether it's uh the kind of the the use of material or form um but what strikes me is that you somehow bring that uh that careful balance of appropriateness to to uh exhibition design and furniture which has this kind of fast turnover and i just wondered if you could say something about your kind of time of working and how you how you manage to take time to think and get that balance right within a kind of um, a type of work that has kind of speed intrinsic to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, so, so sometimes it comes from sometimes it comes from, from, from budget and sometimes it comes from the fact that we're making it ourselves often means that we, we, we design things sort of simply and in a way that we know that we can make it on time and to the budget and, we, and we're not going to make ourselves a real headache when we come to make things. And I think you know, sometimes we, we, we differ to other um, practitioners. In fact, no, knowing that we've got to make it, we've, we've got a sensitivity to that that perhaps others don't. Um, and yeah, and, and I guess it's sort of an, I guess as I showed there, we we we'll often sort of evolve ideas and grow things that we're that, that sort of we've been thinking about or we've been developing. And so we're often not starting from um, from a sort of white page in a way. And we've got uh, I guess often it will start with the material. So um, sometimes the material just feels right for the project or for the, for the for the space and, and that that will often dictate the way that you work um the to our tools and our workshop will often dictate the way that we work um but yeah i, I some of it's just that we're, about the practicalities of of being able to make things vi viably and, and sort of be do, do them ourselves and be, be profitable i think M maybe that constraint actually is is, is a is it is a good thing. It sort of help. It helps you when you when you're designing. I think if we were given a sort of mega budget and a huge huge sort of uh, production team, I, I don't know. It'd, it'd be much harder. I think. Simon, that's a fantastic talk. Fantastic work. And um, my question was about your um, your show uh, with the long tables with the books, book like folded nine mil or 9mm MDF with a piano hinge. And did you screw those piano hinges or glue them? Great question, Michael. <laughs> 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 so, 
Simon, uh, let me unmute Simon. Yeah. This is good that now we're now we're in extra time, you see. Yeah. Hey, Michael. Mm. Hi, Simon. Um, we screwed them into end grain ply. Uh, into end grain? <laughs> yeah, with all those really fiddly little tiny, tiny, tiny screws. Oh, yeah. But I guess there's enough of them yeah. that, that it works. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Nina, Nina would like to ask a question now. Nina. Um, hi, Simon. Uh, amazing lecture. Um, knowing you so well and still uh, obviously not totally realizing, you know, the, the amazing work that you're doing uh, or all of it. So that was super interesting for me. I just have a question, which is really a question about composition because it seems to me when I look at your work that there's a lot of that in in the way you photograph your work for example mm. and I wonder if you want to say something about that yeah you know the the kind of presence of composition yeah um it's true that it's important to us and it, uh, we, we, we sort of invested in a good camera for that Milan exhibition so we could take our own photographs. Um, after sort of being disappointed with how photographers would photograph what we do and sort of by necessity, because exhibitions are very fast and you usually don't get very long between the work being sort of being set up and it being, sort of, you know, being able to get clear access before it's full of people. And so we have taken to taking our own photographs, both in the studio, um, and 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 on site and for exhibitions um and uh, yeah we tried to take care in, in doing it um yeah i don't know in, in, in composition i guess we i sort of felt seeing that in in power in in contrast to other people that we, we we're not very good at sort of doing sort of very stylish or lifestyle type photographs we tend to photograph it in a pretty matter of fact way quite often of our, our, our furniture pieces and, and, and often the exhibitions it's just just try to sort of communicate how things are made and and and, and the ideas behind them um and, and, and yeah i guess co composition is, is kind of always there within the exhibitions of it, imagining how people are going to see see things um and how you present the exhibition as a sort of body of body of work as an, as an overall like the Richard Hollis exhibition for example was an early, an early one that would be seen from the street and we we made these angled panels that when viewed from the street you could see four of them um in parallel and actually with that see 50 percent of the work that's on those tables from the, from the street and um so, yeah, it's a very, very compass, very conscious about the composition of how those, those tables will be outlaid, overlaid, um, laid out. Um, yeah, and, and and I guess how, how it will look in an image afterwards, because the, the images often are, are what live um, live on live on in the exhibitions. There's only a limited number of people who get to see them. Um, I don't say that we, we don't design for the photograph, but um, we're conscious of it. Um, Simon, I'm, I, I just want to kind of press you a little bit further on that link between architecture and furniture design because um, somehow I find myself most drawn to, to architects who design furniture or even, even furniture designers who, who are self-taught in terms of architecture. So I'm thinking of um, designers such as Bruno Matson or Eileen Gray or Charlotte Perriand who had an this amazing exhibition that we saw recently in, in, in Paris or um, I mean a lot of the Milanese architects as well which we we discussed and designers we discussed last week with with Lorenzo Bini and I'm just wondering um, if you can say something about that that kind of link and, and maybe you know that moment where you we could see in, in some of your your work perhaps in the in the, the Japanese tool exhibition that that maybe that those trays could become interiors or they could become structural systems or mm. is there is there a link there or is it just something completely different to you uh, i mean the, the guys that you mention are sort of he heroes you know in a way and i think you know lorenzo's talk magistretti or um castiglioni or 
Um, yeah, the, 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 the yeah. Americans of, of, that, of that era, I think that's whose furniture design on the whole, I, I, I really like, you know, Jakobsen Alto, th those architects I think have made the, the, the best the best furniture and uh, um, an exhibition sort of scale scale work and uh, and with many and with many of them also fantastic architecture as well. I I, I don't know. I, I'm not. <laughs> I can't I can't stand along uh, sort of draw any parallels with with, with them. Um, and I, and I find I find I think one thing I think is very very different about architecture to, to furniture and, and this sort of scale is that architecture is a such a such a long process involving so many people and there's a lot of things that you have to really fight to kind of maintain control of or, or they're just outside of your control um I and I, I find it really difficult i, I don't I sort of find it difficult in practice i find it difficult to work when we do architectural projects um and to a degree that's why we've ended up making things ourselves because we can control those things and and we can evolve or develop designs as we go and, and there's an efficiency in the way that we've been able to work for clients and that often there's they place great trust in us that we'll show them a design or, or sort of evolving ideas and trust that we can sort of evolve them in the end but we we cut out a lot of the time that you spend producing huge packages of fabrication drawings and then all that time on site um arguing with people and um, if you want to make a if you want to make a change, you, you can do it, and, and and everything that gets lost between the architect and the person who's making, um, it's difficult to work at the scale of building. But we you know we we've talked about it. But everything that I've shown is has largely been made by Jack and I, two of us with with occasional hands. Um, sort of a limit to what you can do. Um, but I don't know, this is a lot of these things are much much simpler than architecture yeah. you don't have to keep the water out and you don't have to comply with building regulations and you don't have to navigate through the planning system um yeah Sounds and maybe good. things were easier in the decades ago as well sure i'm, I'm bringing in uh, i think lorenzo lorenzo vini is here and wants to say hello and ask a question lorenzo hello hi hello how are you i'm good yeah very nice to see you Thank you for the lecture. Really enjoyed it, and uh, I love your work. I was thinking, uh, actually, um, so suddenly by looking at your work, uh, I was uh, maybe uh, thinking about this. You probably know this book by Enzo Mari, this Auto Progettazione, no? This little yeah. book he made in the seventies, in which, yeah, he. He designs some furniture and um, and um, yes, exactly. We all should have it, no? <laughs> and and he um, yeah. So you know, he, he designed this furniture and give uh, uh, instructions to to build it yourself, basically, no? Yeah. Um, and I found uh, a lot of uh, similarities in a way in many of your projects uh, that you showed uh, about this, this this kind of approach. But at the same time, uh, I, I was really uh, I'm impressed when I saw this uh, 105 uh, piece of furniture you built in the, in the weekend. And uh, I was well, wondering well, then three weekends. <laughs> and, okay, three weekends. And a lot of, and a lot of work preparing yeah, as is. well. I might add. Yeah. So, but I was I was wondering then uh, um, there is uh, is there uh, actually a pleasure in uh, the repetition of building the furniture you design? So there's almost this kind of um, uh, you could say autistic, but also very um, uh, zen uh, um, process of uh, repeating a gesture of doing. Uh, uh, something that could appear quite you know almost stupid in a way but by the fact that you repeat the same gesture uh, several times uh, it's a way to understand how things are built yeah i but think probably also 
it's also something that uh, simply make you fe makes you feel very well. You're, um, you're, you're exactly you're exactly right. I mean, we 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 really enjoy making in, in quantity, and there's something about making a batch, a, a large batch that you can sort of you can resolve the design, you can make the jigs, and then there's a the satisfaction in just drilling the holes and routing and probably various members of this audience will have <laughs> will have been involved in a, in a in a project I started a few weeks before my wedding where I decided we should make all the furniture for 150 guests in a fortnight. Still got the splinters I think. Yeah. Fingers. Um, at, at, at its extreme. Um, but and yeah and yeah I guess it's something I've sort of, I've been drawn to and I think sort of together with with Jack that the, there's a real there's there's a there's a pleasure in making more of one of something and and the efficiency that comes with tooling up to do it and we're sort of big admirers of those projects by Enzo Mori and actually coincidentally Jack um, mm -hmm. yesterday or the day before actually made um, do, you, do you know this one yes. Because actually, I think we think that Reedvale's chair is better than Enzo Mari's chair. I think Jack had just made a bench out of this and was remarking how how, how good it was, you know, how, how clever it was in the way that it went together in its sort of simplicity and how sort of comfortable it was. And I sort of Enzo Mari's feels like it's a sort of a sort of a manifesto and a sort of political act in, in, in a good way. But actually, the thing's got to function. And, and work well and I, I find that the sort of Enzo Mori stuff is a bit it's a bit too clumsy it's not it's not finesse there's, there's far too much sort of, there's too, too, more timber than you really need there and so the, yeah. um, I don't know uh, we, we also got given the you know Donald Judd stuff which is sort of his, his sort of cutting lists of, of making his pieces and mm. That that feels too far in the other direction. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that that Kunstlerhaus project because um, it, it, that that could have been those types of pieces, sort of quite raw plank made out of sort of scrap material. But at the same time, it was it was trying to cater to a sort of slightly different audience. And once you'd gone to the trouble of designing a chair. Um, it sort of made sense that you should make it out of hardwood because it was stronger and um, it, it, if you tried to design a chair without, without a, a curved back it's just it's not comfortable you can't really sit in it for very long I mean it it's kind of a chair but it's not it's, it, won't, it won't cut it for somebody who's eating, eating a meal and you sort of you realise when you prototype it without that curve back it's just it's uncomfortable I mean as it was for economy and for, for the process that chair had a flat seat which is which is okay and sometimes it had an upholstered seat but you realize what you get from a um, a piece of plywood with a bit of a curve with a bit of a dip in it uh, the, the comfort level is quite different and so that 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 project um, you know, whilst it was made with a load of volunteers and help, we, we spent quite a long time trying to make that chair a, a, a proper chair rather than a, um, yeah, a, rather than just a project. In a way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We've gone we've gone way over time now. Unless has long since left to go to the opera, um, so. <laughs> Perhaps we should we should join. Uh, unless Michael, you have another question. Michael, do you want to say anything else? I w yeah, I w it was not really a question, but um, Lorenzo's question about or comment on the the repetition, the repetitive repetitive element, brought to mind um, something I've just read recently in the biography autobiography of Marky e. Smith from the Fall. I almost picked that as my first track. Did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And he talks, he says this very nice thing about the importance of rep repetition in music and um, how he has this 
this problem with drummers because drummers always just want to go off and do their own thing. And you talked about the wonder of a drum machine is you can get it to do what you want. And it, I think it's very much like that problem of subcontracting processes to factories or subcontractors on site where, like you say, you end up arguing just to get this very simple detail right. But for some reason, a contractor or a subcontractor just won't see or won't be bothered to do or won't take the care or the time. Um, yeah, it was just, uh, I just thought it was an interesting parallel. Completely irrelevant, but interesting. It's a good track though, that. Yeah, good track. <laughs> well, I, think, I think there's definitely a, a good point there that there's, um, in terms of being an architect, it can sometimes be a very frustrating uh, process and a very, you know, for example, Simon, you mentioned in your in your biography that you sent to me that you qualified as an architect in 2003, and we all remember if you if you qualified as an architect, all the all the programs you have to go through are called Part Three, and and mostly it's about dealing with the kind of legalistic issues or contractual issues about trying to get the work out of good work out of contractors, and after a while, it, it feels as though that you just wanted to go directly to just make it myself, you know, and then and then you can kind of remove that 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 equation. But then, if someone wants you to build a large building, you're not, you know, I know you'd really want to build it yourself. You probably would, but you can't <laughs> you know, at some point. Yeah, but some of that I think comes to the skill, to the skill of the architect as well, and 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 how you how you negotiate that. Um, I have a kind of. It's a huge, huge respect for for architects who sort of managed to 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 make good good work, you know, working you know, working through that system and working, um, you know, with contractors and uh, and and they're they're just they're just people and 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 some some of them like making some of them are really into it some some of them are just are doing it because. For a job, I, I don't know. I find, but I, yeah, I, I find it difficult, um, and and not, I very often think, oh, I might as well just make it myself. Um, and have done that on on architectural projects. We we end up making bits and pieces. We we often make the joinery parts of projects ourselves, just because we can't do the plumbing, and there's no point in us doing the decorating or or, or, or those bits. But the but the desks and the shelves and the light, you know, th those bits that that people touch and people make a difference so that you need to, t to really uh, keep control over, um, then yeah, we, we sometimes do do that. Um, yeah. 